And please uh, continue some counting or something about you. About your okay, good. Okay. Um, very happy to have the chance to join you in Mexico uh, through this technology and uh, to be able to speak to you and say a little bit about uh, Tom Regan to um, this audience. Um, yeah, um, sorry that I'm not going to be able to stay with you for the whole panel, but uh, I do have other things that I need to be doing today. I'm sure it'll be a very interesting sure, panel, and I hope I can catch up with it online at some point afterwards. Afterwards. Want me to keep me keep to saying keep something? Keep saying something? No, thank you very much. We appreciate your your time. All right. Uh, no. All right. Um, so just to let everyone know that we're going to wait for a couple more minutes before we start, but I think we're almost ready. Um, and as you can tell, we've got Peter Singer joining us via Skype from, you in Australia, Peter? I am in Australia, yes. I am in Australia, yes. Okay. And um, so just a, a couple more minutes, please. Kim, I'm just wondering in, in terms of this echo, um, maybe it's it's because maybe it's, it's coming, because over, it's your coming over your microphone, and I wonder whether if you turned off that microphone, turn off it, would, microphone it, would kill it, would, it would kill him? It would kill him? If only I knew how to turn the microphone off. I'm sure there's somebody there there's who somebody does. There who does. Anna, where's, where's uh, Anna? And I, uh, is it possible to turn this microphone off? Is the echo on me or is it echo on you when you talk? No, there's no echo on you, which is why yeah, I think it's why, probably think it's coming over my micro over microphone, my microphone because, because obviously, there obviously there would be a slight delay. Be a slight delay um, um, and if it's coming into the room as a whole, your microphone, your microphone might, might pick it up. Might pick it that's up, my that's guess anyway. My guess anyway. Uh, Anna, I think that what we've got to try and achieve is that when Peter talks, all the microphones here are all turned off. If people who are joining us now could please uh, take a place to sit. Uh, because I'd like to uh, begin this panel. Uh, my name is Kim Stallwood and I have the honor of chairing this panel. Um, and it is uh, dedicated to the life and work of Tom Reagan. And I'm just going to wait for a few more people to get settled. Tom Reagan was an American philosopher who specialized in animal rights theory. He was professor emeritus of philosophy at North Carolina State University, where he taught from 1967 until his retirement in 2001. He died on February the 17th, 2017, at his home in North Carolina. He was the author of many books, including All That Dwell Therein, Essays on Animal Rights and Environmental Ethics, The Case for Animal Rights, Animal Sacrifices, Relig Religious Perspectives on the Use of Animals in Science, Defending Animal Rights, and Empty Cages Facing the Challenge of Animal Rights. Tom and his wife, Nancy, co-founded the Culture and Animals Foundation in 1985. Its mission is to advance animal advocacy through intellectual and artistic expression. I first met Tom and Nancy at the RSPCA Rights of Animals Symposium at Trinity College, Cambridge in 1977. 
as a vegan animal rights campaigner, I worked with them throughout the 1980s and 1990s. For example, the Animals and Society Institute, which I co-founded with Ben Shapiro, co-produced with the Culture and Animals Foundation several international compassionate living festivals. I also worked with Tom on NCSU's Tom Reagan Animal Rights Archive, which is the only animal rights collection of its kind in the world. In 2017, I joined the board of the Culture and Animals Foundation, and I also want to recognize in the audience fellow directors, Mia McDonald, Martin Rowe, Joanne MacArthur, and Mylan Engel. It's a great honor to chair this evening's distinguished panel who have been invited to reflect upon Tom Reagan as a beloved friend, inspirational colleague, and brilliant philosopher. The order for this evening will be that each panelist will speak for 10 minutes. This will be followed by a panel discussion of 20 minutes and then a 15 minute question and answer period. That makes up the two hours for this panel. And I will make a brief conclusion at the end. Please know the panel is being translated for conference delegates into Spanish and is being streamlined, st sorry, streamed live, not streamlined, streamed live, and a video of it will be stored at, at UM's uh, channel uh, for this auditorium. We will also place links onto the Minding Animals website so that we can catch up with it all later. A special welcome to those of you who are watching us live. The panelists will speak in alpha order by their last name, except for Peter Singer, who will go first because he's joining us via Skype and uh, is unable to stay with us for the entire two hours, two hours of the panel. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction for each panelist, um, and then um, we will hand it over to Peter Singer, and then um, the UNAM tech person will hopefully turn the microphones off, and hopefully that will uh, end your echo that Peter Singer is experiencing. So the panelists in last name alpha order, John Baird Calicott, distinguished research professor at the University of North Texas, Denton, environmental philosopher, author of In Defense of the Land Ethic and many other books, and debated Tom Reagan when Tom's book, The Case for Animal Rights, was published in 1983. Margot DeMello, adjunct professor at Canisius College in the Anthrozoology Master's Program and Program Director for Human Animal Studies at the Animals and Society Institute. She's the author of Animals and Society, An Introduction to Human Animal Studies, and many other titles. Mylan Engel is Professor of Philosophy at Northern <coughs> Illinois University in DeKalb, DeKalb Illinois. Um, uh, he has published two books on animal ethics, The Philosophy of Animal Rights, A Brief Introduction for Students and Teachers with Kathy Jenny, and The Moral Rights of Animals with Gary Constock, who's also on the board of the Culture and Animals Foundation. And as I said, Mylan serves on the board of directors of the Culture and Animals Foundation. Laurie Gruen, the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy at Wesleyan University, where she coordinates the Wesleyan Animal Studies and she's the author of Entangled Empathy, A New Ethic for Our Relationship with Animals, and many others, and we uh, saw uh, Laurie this, this morning. And I'm going to apologize because I'm not gonna say your name very well. Alejandro Herrera Jibinez, a professor of philosophy at UNA, UNAM. He's prominent Latin American ethicist who specializes in environmental and animal ethics, Leibniz, and critical thinking. Author of many papers in environmental ethics and animal ethics. Um, Alejandro will be making his presentation in English and in Spanish. And Dale Jameson, professor of environmental studies and philosophy, affiliated professor of law 
and director of the Animal Studies Initiative at New York University. Author of Reason in a Dark Time, Why the Struggle to Stop Climate Change Failed and What It Means for Our Future, and Singer and His Critics, two separate books there, Singer and His Critics is the second, published in 1999, and many others. And then lastly, Peter Singer, the Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University, a laureate professor at the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the University of Melbourne, and the author of Animal Liberation and many others. So it's a very uh, great honor for me to introduce this panel to you. Um, it's very exciting to have everyone gathered here today to uh, honor and recall and reflect upon the life and work of Tom Reagan. Um, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to meet Tom and to hear him speak, but he was indeed, I believe, and I'm sure many of you would, would agree with me that he was a very special person. So with that, uh, let's start the panel off and uh, go to uh, Peter Singer in Australia and they'll quieten the microphones and uh, I'll come back after Peter has finished. Thank you very much, Kim. Very much, um, Kim. Um, and I want to thank want all to of thank those who've been involved in organizing this event and having a panel to commemorate and mark uh, Tom's, uh, Tom's significant work significant for, work animals. for animals. So, um, so um, let me just let me start go. with saying a little bit about little bit my about first, first contacts, contacts with Tom. With Tom. Um, they go back to the, back uh, to the early 1970s. Uh, early 1970s. In, in 1973, 1973, I published an article published under the heading under Animal, the liberation Animal Liberation in the New York in Review of Books, of books which was a review of a book, a by, book by, uh, edited by Stanley and Rosalind Rodlovich and John Harris, and John Harris uh, called Animals, uh, Men and Morals. Animals, men and, morals. and this was the first and time that I time that used I the term used Animal Liberation in print. In print. And also the first time I first time I you did developed you the, developed uh, the uh, concept of speciesism, concept of which speciesism, I didn't which coin. It was coined by was coined Richard by Ryder, Richard uh, Ryder uh, somebody I knew at Oxford. Somebody I knew at Oxford. Um, but I um, guess I, I developed it a little bit philosophically, little and, philosophically and, 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 and basically basically made the arguments, made the uh, arguments in a very brief the, form that I later put into Animal Liberation. So after publishing that, I got a letter from Tom Regan, who I'd not heard of at, at that time, uh, saying, that he, uh, saying that he uh, had read the article, that he um, was sympathetic to the general conclusion that there was something very seriously wrong about the way we treat animals and that we ought to be vegetarian, which is also something I'd argued in the New York Review of Books article. Um, and uh, mentioned that he was coming to Oxford over the summer. Uh, I was in Oxford at the time. Um, uh, that he was coming to Oxford in, over the summer, I think with a group of students from uh, North Carolina State University, if I remember correctly, um, some kind of study tour, and that he'd like the chance to meet me. So uh, I think it was in that summer of, of 73 that we met. Um, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, that was a very congenial yeah, meeting. Very congenial we meeting. Uh, were we, both uh, interested were in this issue. Interested there were very, issue. very, few, were philosophers, very few philosophers, to my knowledge, to my knowledge who were interested in this were issue. Interested in this issue. Uh, uh, Jim Rachels had Jim sent, Rachels me, a, had sent me, a me a letter uh, uh, after, uh, the after the publication of the New York Review of Books piece, saying that he'd often wondered he'd why, often uh, why uh, we were entitled to uh, treat animals the way we do, and, we uh, do, and uh, my uh, essay had made him think that perhaps, perhaps we weren't entitled to treat them in that way. But I think he was the only other professional philosopher, apart from Tom Regan, as far as I can remember anyway, who really contacted me at the time with a positive response saying something like, you know, like, yes, you know, um, yes, I think I'm, um, I think I'm significantly in agreement with, with you on that issue. On that so issue. it was good to, so to meet good Tom to, and uh, to, talk and, to, uh, to talk to him about those issues. About those issues. And uh, I suppose we had some correspondence. I was then uh, uh, 
thinking about writing um, animal, animal liberation, animal I guess, liberation, uh, it, I guess didn't come out uh, till it didn't come out till the fall of 1975. 1975. And Tom was also Tom working was also on his working own, on his uh, own uh, article, The Moral Basis of Vegetarianism, which came out in the Canadian Journal of Philosophy in October 1975. So pretty similar sort of timing to my book. So there was some contact between us there. But the other thing that happened the was that, that, happened um, was that um, uh, in, 1970, uh, in 1970, in the fall of 1974, um, I came um, to New York. I, I had a one-year visiting, one visiting position at New York University. New York University. And, uh, and during, uh, that time, during that time, uh, Tom and I, Tom and um, I met again. Um, met again. Um, at his place in, his place in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, I, guess. Carolina, I, I did go down I to North Carolina, down Carolina down for a colloquium in Chapel Hill, I remember, so maybe it was the same trip, I don't really remember the details, but he certainly invited me to North Carolina State University, and Nancy and Tom invited me to their home, so that was a very congenial meeting that we had there. And I think it was uh, think on, it was that, occasion on that, that, uh, that occasion that uh, Tom suggested, or perhaps Tom it could have been earlier, I guess, have been earlier, um, I guess that um, that we might co-edit co an, an anthology, an anthology, or, a anthology articles or a collection of articles on, articles on, on um, questions, um, about questions, questions about ethical questions about, questions about animals, animals, questions about animals uh, questions about uh, which there were, uh, which there were, you know, really practically uh, none um, at the time that we were doing this. There's certainly no contemporary or very few contemporary pieces. There were, um, there were pieces from animal pieces rights, from, uh, animal rights uh, from animals, men, and morals, animals, the book that I reviewed in the New York Review, in the New York books, um, which, um, and of course there were historical course, pieces were which were not very well were known, very well known, and they'd been very much neglected. Very much neglected but there were, um, there were um, some remarks um, by remarks classic by philosophers by like uh, Plutarch like, uh, and Porphyry. Um, then a, a long then gap in the tradition, going, the tradition going, down going down to Montaigne and. Descartes, on the, Descartes side, on the other side, of course, a uh, variety of uh, people. So, variety of people. so we talked about putting that together and, uh, together and uh, put in a, a version of Tom's uh, Moral Base of Vegetarianism uh, article and uh, something, something from animal, something animal Liberation. Animal liberation. And, uh, and uh, we found a good publisher in Prentice Hall, Hall, so Animal Rights and Human, and obligations, human obligations, edited by Tom and myself, was first published in 1976 and did pretty well, as it was the only anthology of articles of animals around as the issue attracted more attention and began to take off became quite widely used in classrooms and eventually Tom and I produced a second edition in 1989 um, by which time of course there was a lot more contemporary material around so um, we we had that we had working relationship uh, over that over um, that and uh, we continued, uh, to, stay we continued to stay in touch. We felt that we were comrades in arms in a new in movement, a, new um, movement, a movement uh, that we were both very we pleased, were both to very pleased to see was growing, was growing. Um, started to grow quite started rapidly, grow rapidly um, in the 1970s, in the 1970s particularly, with the particularly with the founding of People of for the Ethical people Treatment of Animals, which, animals um, which um, Ingrid Newkirk and Alex Newkirk Pacheco and Alex had founded, and, uh, and uh, that took uh, off with a lot of publicity over, over the Silver the Spring Monkey Silver case Spring that they exposed, uh, 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 horrible experiments on monkeys conducted in Silver Springs, Maryland. So we were very glad to be part of that, and I think we spoke on a number of occasions on similar platforms and similar, similar occasions, similar certainly occasions, at a March, March for Animals in Washington, D.C. Washington, um, and obviously, and there, was obviously there was a lot that we were fully in agreement fully on. In agreement so we were in agreement that speciesism is wrong, that we are not entitled to treat animals in the way we do treat them, that our entire thinking about the moral status of animals is misconceived, that it has started from the wrong place, and and that, uh, that there is some sense, there is in, some which sense in which we and non-human non -human animals, non -human are animals are moral equals. Moral equals. Uh, and I think the, the and, and, and we also agreed on practical matters. Uh, certainly, we agreed on uh, factory farming being an abomination. We agreed on uh, the fact that. Uh, uh, the whole institution, the whole institution of experimenting of on animals, on animals uh, research on animals, uh, research on animals was, was founded on the false premise the that false animals premise are just animals there for us to use, that they, use, uh, they, uh, that they uh, don't have they don't moral have claims have upon us, claims except perhaps some minimal claims that not be treated with wanton cruelty. 
we thought that was a mistaken premise that in fact uh, we have obligations to animals that go far beyond not inflicting wanton cruelty on them on them so those were all really important uh, commonalities but i think um even though this is a panel that is uh, commemorating uh, tom regan and his uh, work i, I think uh, I would not to shrink from saying that we had pretty important fundamental differences as well, philosophical differences. And Tom uh, and I are both philosophers, and I think we, as other philosophers on the panel will very well know, um, philosophers respect each other's differences, and it doesn't interfere uh, with um, still being friends and uh, working together on, on common causes. But those uh, those differences are important, and it's important to get them out and to explain and write them over, by, uh, sort of uh, uh, talk them over, uh, and not not simply to pretend, simply to pretend uh, that something uh, that somehow something we're, we're all in harmony we're about, all everything. about everything. So, um, so um, I will just mention, will just mention some, some of those differences, of those differences uh, very briefly, of course, in the time that we have. Uh, there was an exchange uh, was in exchange philosophy and public philosophy affairs and that we had in 1980. Had in 1980. Tom wrote an article wrote on, an article utilitarianism, on utilitarianism, vegetarianism, and animal rights, and animal rights in which he, in which he uh, argued against argued my against view, my uh, view uh, essentially, uh, essentially saying I think that saying, I think, uh, utilitarianism, uh, utilitarianism, utilitarianism doesn't support doesn't vegetarianism, vegetarianism um, and also he thought that it gets the wrong answers in terms of some questions about human rights, and particularly how we ought to treat what he called non paradigmatic humans, humans. Uh, what's sometimes called the uh, argument for marginal, marginal cases, cases, which goes back to Bentham, who, to Bentham, who asked, uh, asked, can an animal reason or talk? Um, talk. Um, the issue is, the, issue the question is, can they suffer? Can they and supported that and by supported saying, that and if it was saying, that, if it that was, they could reason or talk, if that was somehow morally, morally crucial, crucial, then, uh, then uh, the fact that a horse or a dog is more conversable or more rational than an infant of a day or a month old would show that uh, they have more rights than the more infants rights do. So it does. So, so you know that's a, that's a, that's an old argument. And Tom thought that utilitarianism gives you the wrong view on that. Um, I responded in an essay called uh, "Utilitarianism and Vegetarianism," and uh, both defended the view that I think utilitarianism does support. Uh, vegetarianism, vegetarianism, and also, and also uh, uh, defended the defended uh, the, uh, the idea that the idea that um, um, we ought we ought to be more, to be more open to the possibility that some of our common moral intuitions are wrong. I think. I think one of the differences between the differences Tom and myself is that perhaps is the uh, I'm readier to jettison widely held common moral intuitions than he was, and that was and true, that was true uh, certainly about the treatment of these non-paradigmatic non humans. Humans. Um, humans. But of course, Tom was challenging common moral views about animals and about vegetarianism. There's no doubt about that. So this is a perhaps a marginal difference between us. We also had another also notable had exchange notable in the New York Review of Books in the, of books books in the mid 1980s. Um, in 1980, 1980, January 1985, 1985, I wrote a piece wrote called Ten Years of Animal Liberation, animal liberation uh, 10, years uh, 10 years after, after the publication of publication my book, Animal Liberation, animal liberation which I reviewed a number of books, number including, books uh, including two of Tom's, two of Tom's uh, All That Dwell uh, Therein, and The Case and for case Animal Rights. And I said that they were important works, particularly that the case was uh, presents an important, uh, presents an important and important distinctive, basis distinctive basis for, uh, for uh, giving animals a different animals moral status. Um, and uh, and emphasised the, emphasize the agreements between Tom and myself, between Tom but, and also but also pointed out that there were some differences. Were some differences. And here, and I, here tackled I tackled a point on which Tom, point on which Tom and I have and had a have disagreement, had and, that is and that is whether uh, uh, there could uh, ever could even, even hypothetically even be a case in which it was justifiable to perform a harmful experiment on a non-human animal in order to benefit humans. Uh, I suggested and I stressed that this stressed is, of course, this completely, is hypothetical, completely hypothetical, that if you could perform that an experiment on a single animal, single animal uh, even if uh, harming that animal, that, that would, animal, that would cure, provide a cure, provide for, a cure cancer, for cancer, then cancer, that would be a justifiable thing to do. And obviously, as a utilitarian, I have to say that. Tom rejected that. He said that the animal rights movement, as he understands it, is the total abolition of harmful experiments on animals, as well as the total abolition of commercial agriculture. Um, 
Um, but I thought it was a, a, a little strange that he should take this view, given that in the case for animal rights, he uh, asks us to imagine this case, uh, the lifeboat case, where there are four humans and a dog in a lifeboat. And he says it would be justifiable if the lifeboat was overloaded and was going to sink. It would be justifiable to throw out the dog. We have to assume, I guess, it's a large dog for this sense. Um, um, but he, th he not only said it would be justifiable to throw out the dog because the dog's, because the dog's life is, uh, life is uh, less of value than the human life, the human life. Um, but he, even, he said but this doesn't said depend this on doesn't aggregating, aggregating benefits, benefits, and it would be true, even, would be if, you true even if you had to throw a million dogs overboard rather than throw rather than one, throw human. one human. Um, um, so, so I found this a little strange, this a little and, strange difficult and difficult to reconcile with the ideas of equal value. Tom then replied, we had an exchange had in the exchange pages of the New York Review, the New York Review um, in April of 2015, of, sorry, 18, uh, 1985, um, in which he said the cases are different because the dog is at risk anyway. In the lifeboat, you aren't imposing a risk on the dog that um, you, as you are when you take a healthy dog and use it in an experiment where it's under no risk. Um, I didn't think this was an adequate response because, after all, you can imagine a case where the dog is at risk. Let's say there's a dangerous virus that is equally painful and lethal for humans and dogs. So then the dog is at risk, dog as well. risk as well um, and um, yet and yet i don't think it, i, don't I know think you know it I seemed that tom would be committed to saying to say, saying that you can't do the experiment and i didn't really see didn't the distinction really see in, the in, distinction that in that case so uh, there were those so, issues, between, issues us, between us and i continue to say and i know that it's controversial among some animal rights people but there are at least hypothetical cases and possibly depending on the facts some actual cases in which uh, which, uh, it can be justifiable uh, to harm an animal where the benefits where the are benefits clearly um, going the other way. Mm, and the other indeed, way. there can and be some cases, in my view, in where, my it view be, where it could be uh, justifiable to harm a human in order to bring about a great benefit to a large number of animals. So this is not speciesism. Um, it is still a position that accepts equal consideration of interest, which is the basis on which I put, uh, hold my views. I'm aware that I've, uh, or I'm already over my time. It's a pity this is such a uh, large topic that uh, one could talk about, and I'm sure others will. But I will end there so that you have time for all the other speakers. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, Peter, can you hear me now speaking? I can hear you. Yes, I can still hear you. Yes, I can still hear you. Okay. Well, Peter, thank you very much for your contribution. Yes, you did go well over your time. Um, and I'm only going to extend that courtesy to you because you're actually not physically in the room. But I'm going to let the fellow panelists know that they only have 10 minutes each. So okay. Apologies for setting a bad example. Setting a bad example. Yeah, yeah. Don't get clever with me, Dale. Um, so, Peter, we will let you uh, sit with us for as long as you're able to, and then if we see you disappear at some point, uh, again, thank you very much for participating today. Yeah, I will have to go pretty soon, unfortunately. Thanks. Yeah, unfortunately, thanks. Uh, okay, so um, the uh, presentation of the panelists is going to be in uh, alpha last name. So the first uh, person on the panelist to speak is John Bed Calicott. And uh, um, some of them are going to speak from the table, and some of them are going to use the lecture. Is this working? Uh, closer. Speak closer. Thank you very much. Yes. There, there we go. Um, I first engaged uh, Tom Reagan's work uh, with an ill-considered screed titled Animal Liberation, a Triangular Affair. Tom was the first to charge that the Aldo Leopold land ethic, which I there interpreted and championed, um, was a case of environmental fascism, making the good of its individual members, including human members, uh, subordinate to the good of the whole biotic community. And he was right. And that was a blessing because it led me to think about the land ethic more deeply and to better interpret it. The summary moral maxim of the land ethic is this. The thing is right when it 
when it preserves when it tends to preserve the integrity stability and beauty of the biotic community it is wrong when it tends otherwise i had interpreted when to mean if and only if but there was solid evidence that leopold had meant just if by when not if and only if that is preserving the integrity stability and beauty of the biotic community is a sufficient but not a necessary condition of the things being right. Other things such as respecting individual human rights and perhaps animal rights might also be right. That opened up the possibility of generalizing the communitarian foundations of the land ethic as a universal alternative paradigm for ethics alongside Kantian deontology, which Reagan favored, and utilitarianism, which P Peter Singer favored, as we've just heard, and virtue ethics, which was just around that time being revived by Alastair McIntyre. In short, our many community memberships generate specific duties and obligations that preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of those communities. We have specific duties and obligations toward family members that hold families together, and we have different specific obligations and duties uh, generated by membership in the greater human community, among them to respect universal human rights. And as members of various mixed human animal communities, we have specific duties and obligations, fellow members generated by uh, each such community membership, about which I'll be talking more fully in my plenary presentation. In a book review of Tom Reagan's magnum opus, The Case for Animal Rights, I returned the favor. Tom there wrote that the goal of wildlife management, a field of applied science founded by Aldo Leopold, quote, should be to protect wild animals from those who would violate their rights, to defend wild animals in the possession of their rights, providing them with the opportunity to live their own life by their own lights as best they can, spared that human predation which goes by the name of sport. But then, shouldn't we, um, excuse me, um, but then shouldn't we defend wild animals in the possession of their rights against predation by non-human as well as by human predators? To his everlasting credit, Tom resisted this implication right up to the last years of his life. He fully realized that intervening um, in the literally eons old economy of nature to prevent uh, animals preying on other animals would result in ecological havoc and total ecological collapse. And he fully realized that if this implication held up, it would constitute a reductio ad absurdum of animal uh, rights uh, theory, no less than if the charge of environmental fascism against it held up, the land ethic would be reduced to absurdity. And so he devised arguments against such intervention. The first was that non-human predators, unlike human ones, were not moral agents and thus could do no wrong. I countered that we protect the rights of humans against psychopathic human killers who are so mentally impaired that they cannot distinguish right from wrong. We do not punish them, but we do remove them from human communities in order to protect human rights. So by parity of reasoning, shouldn't we remove non-human uh, moral agent, non-human killers from the biotic community in order to protect animal rights. His first argument lacking traction, Tom's last attempt to avoid the ecologically disastrous logic of animal rights theory came in 2013. He argued that we patronize <coughs> non-human wild animal rights holders by attempting to protect them from predation by other non-human wild animals. We fail to respect their competence to protect themselves and their offspring. I reserve judgment about the success of this way of avoiding the conclusion that we have a duty to protect wild animals from predation by other wild animals. Instead, I want to laud Tom for trying. 
Other animal ethicists, um, Oscar Orta among them, I think, uh, my friend whom I respect, um, now actually seem to be advocating purging nature of as many forms of suffering as possible, the ecological consequences of doing so be damned. To advocate willfully dismantling the web of life eons in the making on the basis of ethical sensibilities and theories arising only moments ago in evolutionary measures of time appears to me to be completely mad. Uh, to me, that is a frightening turn in contemporary animal ethics, and evidently Tom Reagan thought so too. Fred, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, the next speaker is uh, Margot de Mello. Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. Um, so first, I need to say I did not know Tom personally, like a lot of people on this panel and maybe some people in this room. And I'm also not a philosopher or an ethicist, so I can't really give um, any kind of um, uh, critique uh, about his work. Instead, I wanted just to speak briefly and give some thoughts on his the, the impact of his work on the field of um, what I still call human animal studies, what is increasingly called animal studies today. Um, so, both Reagan's Case for Animal Rights and Singer's Animal Liberation are the two books that we typically point to when doing a history of the field, that is the field of human animal studies, animal studies, that in my opinion really allowed for the field to emerge as a field. Um, both of which built on their earlier quite groundbreaking work. And, and even by the time both books were published, the work was groundbreaking and led to other philosophers writing their own pieces after that. Um, but back to the field, there had of course been books looking at the human-animal relationship if we use that criteria to distinguish the field at a bare minimum. So we had books by Ritvo, Thomas, Lansbury, Clutton Brock, a little bit later Herzog, Marvin, Serpel, Arluck, uh, Podprosek, Sanders, etc. These were people that were writing in the 80s uh, and in the 90s before the field really had a name. Um, but um, these two books, again, going back to, to the case for animal rights as well as animal liberation, helped transform what had been disparate works from a variety of different fields, all of which looked at human-animal relationships into a um, semi-cohesive field um, with a name or multiple names, animal studies, anthrozoology, et cetera, um, its own journals, its own conferences, um, you know, and its own sort of the whole rubric, in part by providing an ethical grounding for the field, something which had been, as we can now see in retrospect, sorely lacking uh, in those early years. Without an ethical grounding, the field would have remained, or could have remained, um, as it began, a collection of scholars who used animals as the object of their research rather than as subjects of the researcher's work and, uh, to, to paraphrase Tom Reagan, um, subjects of their own lives. Reagan and, Singer, uh, Reagan and Singer's work also led to the development of the specific field of animal ethics, which now has its own journals, conferences, its own key works um, beyond those of Singer and Reagan, and dozens of college courses around the world. It's difficult for me to think of a way to either give an overview of the development of the field or to teach an overview course on the relationships between humans and animals without referencing these two works. Um, that's why my own introductory textbook, Animals and Society, which is largely used in social science classes, um, in that book I still devoted a chapter to ethical considerations of other animals, um, which began with an overview of both Singer and Reagan's work. Um, in my own teaching, which again is grounded in social sciences, I'm a cultural anthropologist, I have the students read excerpts of both men. Um, it doesn't matter what my students' background come where they come from, but the, the work always um, moves them. It resonates with them. Just as importantly, or perhaps even more so, these books, but in particular Reagan's, helped to bring about the modern animal rights movement. Tom Reagan not only developed a theoretical argument for animal rights, but devoted the rest of his career, his scholarship, and his personal life to trying to make that theory into reality, to giving animals rights. 
perhaps because of his activist work outside of academia, Reagan's work has been read by two generations of animal activists since the 1980s. And in part because of this, as well as to other historical and social developments, um, the contemporary or what you might call the second wave animal rights movement um, emerged in the 70s and 80s from a century of what had been largely animal welfare activism. The animal rights movement, which has as its goal the liberation of animals from exploitation, is linked to the current field of human animal studies in a number of ways. We might look to the field of women's studies and its relationship to feminist activism as a comparison. Um, one way, for instance, that women's studies or feminist studies is so important is that the academic field provides the theoretical groundwork that informs feminist activism in the real world. Um, we cannot say the same thing, at least at this point, for animal rights and human animal studies. Rather, many scholars see the animal rights movement as the applied arm of, or perhaps offering the ultimate end goal for, their own scholarship. For many such scholars, academic work on animals and animal issues can and should be used to help actual animals. Other scholars, too, either are activists outside of their academic work, as Reagan was, or see their scholarship as a form of activism itself. Um, in addition today, a growing number of young animal studies scholars enter the field not only through a commitment to animals, but from a place of activism. The work of Singer and Reagan, then, continues to play a critical role in how the field develops and continues to develop. Their books operate as a bridge between animal activism and animal scholarship. And when, as is so often the case today, students enter the field through activism, they bring a theoretical understanding of animals as beings worthy of moral consideration with them, having read Singer and Reagan already, which was not always the case, and certainly was not always the case in the previous generation of human animal studies scholars. What this means is that scholars today are committed not all, many scholars today are committed um, uh, da, 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 um, to not just understanding the complex and often negative relationships between people and other animals, but many are also committed to using their scholarship and teaching to benefit the lives of animals. In my own field, cultural anthropology, the idea of reciprocity has long been central to the discipline. In other words, the idea that um, we as scholars owe something to the people with whom we work um, and whose lives provide the grist for our scholarly output. That reciprocity can take many forms. It used to, back in the old days, involve giving tobacco, liquor, and candy uh, to the people. Um, but today, the goal is that the benefits from the scholarly work should be shared equally among the researchers and the people and cultures who are the objects and subjects of their research. That idea has largely been absent from what we could call mainstream animal studies. I would argue that the founding generation of the field, the sociologists, the historians, the psychologists, and others who were writing about animals in the 1980s and 90s did not really consider how either their work might or could impact animals, nor did they, did they address the ways in which animals suffer under human control, nor did they offer solutions to those largely unaddressed problems. The exception to this, again, is Singer and even more so Reagan, who, as I mentioned before, whose scholarship and personal life and charitable work was devoted to animals. Um, to me, this is the most important impact that Reagan's work has had for the field. Students and scholars who have read Reagan possess a shared understanding about why animals matter and a language with which to express that. On a more personal note, Tom Reagan was also instrumental in building this field for another reason. In 2004, the Culture and Animals Foundation, in association with the Animals and Society Institute, which I think was called Society and Animals Forum back then, um, um, held the Compassionate Living Festival, which uh, Kim mentioned. Um, after that meeting in 2004, uh, Ken Shapiro brought together a group of animal studies, human animal studies scholars at that time for a um, separate session on how to help build the field of human animal studies. Um, at that meeting and at subsequent meetings after that, we developed a number of ways to do so, including creating materials for faculty to um, um, build their own majors or minor programs at their university, creating a listserv for faculty and for scholars and students to communicate. Um, 
we decided to write a book together. This book, which is being sold by the um, Lantern Press table out front, is Teaching the Animal. This is essentially a guidebook for teaching human-animal studies from 15 dis different disciplines. Two of uh, the folks up here, Lord Bruin and Mylan, have both um, co-authored chapters in here. And in fact, Mylan and Kathy Jenny, who's uh, out there someplace, their chapter on ethics is so popular in the book and so important to people who are building courses that Lantern also offers it as a standalone um, monograph, which you can buy by itself. Um, so that is obviously super important. We also came up with the idea at uh, that meeting or maybe a subsequent meeting of creating the Human Animal Studies Fellowship, the first year of which in 2007 was held at Tom's North Carolina State University with Tom as the host and faculty mentor and which ended up a few years later finding a home at Wesleyan under the mentorship of Lori Bruin. That program, which culminated in the 2016 Fellow Travelers Conference, also at Wesleyan, offered dozens of scholars from around the world the opportunity to work on a project of their own for six weeks and gen generated many of today's new generation of young scholars. So for that alone, I am grateful. Thank you. Margo, thank you very much for that. That is great to, to have that history uh, uh, and relevance of, of Tom's work. So the next speaker is Mylan Engel. It's truly an honor, can people hear me? It's truly an honor to be able to publicly honor my friend and mentor, Tom Reagan. I want to thank Kim and Rod and the rest of the Minding Animals Board for organizing this panel. Um, it's a privilege to be on the panel. Fifty years ago, the suggestion that non-human animals have moral rights, indeed many of the same rights as human beings, would have likely been met with incredulous stares, if not outright ridicule, both within, within and outside the philosophical community. Fast forward to the present. A recent Gallup poll conducted in May 2015 found that 32% of Americans, poor terminology, U.S. citizens, believe that, uh, so 32% of U.S. citizens believe that, quote, animals deserve the exact same rights as people to be free from harm and exploitation. Another 62% believe that animals deserve, quote, some protection from harm and exploitation, while only 3% think that animals don't need much protection, quote, since they're just animals. The attitudes of philosophers have shifted as well. A poll of over 2,000 professional philosophers conducted by Brian Leiter in October 2012 found that 8% of professional philosophers are vegan, a rate eight times higher than the general population, and another 25% are vegetarians, also about eight times higher than the general population, making roughly one-third of professional philosophers vegetarian or vegan. Of the 67% uh, of, of philosophers who are omnivores, more than half profess ethical doubts about their eating practices, presumably because they think they should be vegetarian or vegan. So, we are winning. We are winning the battle of ideas. What accounts for this sea change of attitudes? There are no doubt many contributing factors. Certainly the timeless work of activists, especially those who have risked and continue to risk their personal safety to secure undercover footage of the atrocities taking place in factory farms, scientific laboratories, and fur farms has played a role, as has the nearly ubiquitous access to this footage via YouTube, Facebook, and other internet sources. But to spur this degree of activism and commitment to animal rights, there needed to be a catalyst, a compelling rational basis for thinking that animals have moral rights. Tom Reagan provided that catalyst in 1983 with the publication of his groundbreaking book, The Case for Animal Rights. In this book, Tom spelled out what remains the most comprehensive and rigorous defense of animal rights to date. He also, and this is often neglected, he also provided the first and best defense of abolitionism in the animal rights movement. He began his defense of the rights view by arguing that other leading approaches to ethics fail. Utilitarianism fails because it sanctions sacrificing individuals for trivial gains in aggregate utility, something the rights view would never condone. 
contractarianism fails because it entails that we have no direct duties to those humans, for example, infants, who are incapable of understanding the contract. In contrast, Reagan's rights view holds that all human beings have equal inherent value. Because all human beings are equally inherently valuable, Reagan argues, they have an equal right to be treated in ways that respect their inherent value. What is it about normal adult humans, or what makes normal adult humans equally inherently valuable, according to Reagan, is the fact that they are subjects of a life. Individuals are subjects of a life if they are able to perceive and remember, if they have beliefs, desires, and preferences, if they're able to act intentionally in pursuit of their goals or desires, if they are sentient and have an emotional life. As such, subjects of a life are some ones they are not some things. They have biographies, not just histories. They have an individual experiential welfare. Their lives can fare well for them or fare ill for them over time. Since human infants, senile humans, and intellectually disabled humans are also subjects of a life, Reagan maintains that they too have equal inherent value and the same right to respectful treatment as all other humans. Having argued that all subjects of a life have equal inherent value, Reagan next observes that humans aren't the, only, uh, aren't the only animals who are experiencing subjects of a life. Many non-human animals, we now know mammals, birds, and fishes, uh, are also subjects of a life in that they too are conscious creatures with preferences and individual welfares that are important to them. Since these animals are also subjects of a life, consistency requires us to conclude that they too have an equal right uh, that they too have equal inherent value and an equal moral right to be treated in ways that respect their value. And as such, they cannot be used as mere means to our ends. That, in a nutshell, is the case for animal rights. Reagan then spells out the abolitionist implications of the truth of animal rights. When we treat inherently valuable animal subjects in ways that reduce them to the status of things, we fail to respect their inherent value. We violate their rights and we treat them wrongly. Since it's wrong to treat inherently value subjects as mere things, the rights view calls for, quote, the total abolition of the use of animals in science, the total dissolution of commercial animal agriculture, and the total elimination of commercial and sport hunting and trapping. In a later work, Tom eloquently made the point as follows. When it comes to how humans exploit animals, recognition of their rights requires abolition, not reform. Whether we exploit animals to eat, to wear, to entertain us, or to learn, the truth of animal rights requires empty cages, not larger cages. Those familiar with Tom's written work know that he was one of the most powerful voices in the animal advocacy movement. What may be less well known was Tom's commitment to helping others find their own voices. In 1985, Tom and his wife Nancy founded the Culture and Animals Foundation, which Kim mentioned. Um, that's the only all-volunteer organization exclusively dedicated to the intellectual and artistic expression uh, designed to raise awareness of animal rights. Since its inception, CAF has provided grants to hundreds of scholars, artists, and performers working to improve our relationship with and our treatment of non-human animals, several of whom are participants at this conference. I first learned about the Culture and Animals Foundation, I'll call it CAF from here on out, through a chance encounter with Tom at the World Congress for Animals in 1996. I was working with a team video documenting the event. After Tom's amazing presentation at the Congress, I asked him if we could interview him. Tom had no idea who I was, yet he graciously agreed to be interviewed and was incredibly generous with his time. He spent over 40 minutes with me as we interviewed him. After the interview, Tom said in passing, you should come to my conference. Your conference? What conference is that? the Compassionate Living Festival taking place in Raleigh this fall. I took down the information about the conference and we said our goodbyes. I did attend the Compassionate Living Festival that fall and was amazed both by the quality of the speakers and by the depth and substance of their presentations. Not to mention the book exhibits, AR organization exhibits, the amazing vegan food in 1996. Wow. And the, warm and welcome, the warmth and welcoming, welcomingness of the conference. During the conference, Tom made a point of introducing me to each speaker, despite having just met me in June. And at some point during the conference, he encouraged me to submit a grant proposal to CAF. 
which I did. The following March, I was surprised and elated to receive a handwritten letter from Tom indicating that the board had awarded me a summer stipend to complete my grant project. That grant led to my first article defending ethical veganism. Over the years, Tom continued to support my research uh, and uh, directed opportunities my way, but I was not unique. The interest Tom took in my work was no different than the interest he took in the work of other CAF grant recipients. Indeed, Tom used the Compassionate Living Festival to showcase much of the CAF-funded research. Uh, and I just want to conclude now with a little uh, uh, anecdote about the festival. I, I, it was such a privilege to be able to attend so many of the Compassionate Living Festivals that I was able to attend. By popular demand, Tom always gave the concluding talk at these festivals. His talks were humorous, engaging, enlightening, and profoundly moving. Tom was one of the few philosophers who recognized that animal rights appeals to both the heart and the head and wasn't afraid to appeal to both. In, the in his concluding talks, Tom often expressed concern about, quote, revolving door animal rights activists, people who become very active in the animal rights movement but eventually burn out and leave the movement. With animals' lives and well-being at stake, Tom knew that the animal rights movement can't afford to lose any activist. So in closing, I want to share with you an exercise that Tom used to inspire festi festival goers to remain active in the movement. He asked us to close our eyes and think of a totem animal. So in honor of Tom, please close your eyes. With your eyes closed, I want you to think about a specific animal you once encountered who needed your help or needed rescuing, but who you were unable to help, who for some reason through no fault of your, your own you had to abandon. Picture that animal. Think about how it made you feel to not be able to help that animal. Burn that animal into your, that animal's image into your mind. That is your totem animal. Now, channeling Tom, I ask you to make a commitment to that totem animal to remain active in the animal rights movement. Commit to helping the animals you can help in the memory of your totem animal whom you couldn't help, and never become a revolving door animal rights activist. The animals need you. Thank you. Mylan, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I remember Tom making that presentation, and uh, the room was absolutely silent uh, whilst that was happening. Um, the next speaker is, is Laurie Gruen. I, too, am really... Can you hear me? Not going? Not working? <laughs> Dale can hear me. He doesn't need to. Is that better? Thanks so much. Okay. Um, so when I was in graduate school at the University of Arizona in 1984, um, I was involved in animal activism. Um, and I was also studying for my PhD in philosophy. And um, I organized a protest at the uh, medical school where they were doing research on greyhounds and was arrested. And this is a photograph of uh, me being escorted away by uh, police officers that ran on the front page of the campus paper. And uh, my department chair at the time, I had a fairly um, generous fellowship, uh, wasn't really very happy to see their fellowship student on the front of the, of the school paper called the Arizona Daily Wildcat being uh, arrested. Um, and basically called me in for a meeting and said that I had a choice. I could choose to study philosophy or I could be an activist. And so I left philosophy at the time. And I went to work at the nascent People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals as it was getting started. And in those very early days um, of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, there were just a handful of us living in a small house um, in Bethesda, Maryland. And um, as we grew, we moved to a little warehouse in Kensington 
um, and during that period, I was working pretty much nonstop on the University of Pennsylvania head injury case. Um, and I was traveling between Bethesda and Philadelphia and trying to organize an end to um, this baboon research in the Generali Laboratory. And I, uh, again, working with PETA, helped to organize a sit-in at the National Institutes of Health. Um, and that sit-in ultimately ended the funding of the Generali Laboratory. Um, and um, actually, uh, there was a group of us that met in DC not too long ago to mark the 30th anniversary. But basically, um, this was a really big moment in the animal rights movement. And it was uh, very momentous um, from the point of view of the animals that were being used, obviously. But it was also a really important um, and transformative event for me because Tom Reagan was also in this four-day sit-in with us at, um, at the NIH. And Tom, of course, was a professional philosopher and an activist. And I had just been told I had to make a choice between being a philosopher and being an activist. And so Tom being there was a remarkable um, statement about what was possible. He was also incredibly supportive of all of the other activists who we, we went in to the building expecting to be arrested and taken out. And it ended up that they decided to leave us stay. And so then we stayed and then we stayed and then we stayed. And it was pretty stressful for people. And Tom's presence there was just really remarkable. Um, and I ended up, as you know, <laughs> going back to graduate school and getting a PhD um, in philosophy, yay. Um, and, um, and a large part of that was that it seemed like I could do both of these things together. So to go back to one of Rod's comments earlier, um, there is an important way in which academic work and activist work can be done together. And Tom was a, a beacon of how to do that kind of work. Um, after I got my PhD in philosophy, um, Tom and I would appear in various debates because as, as um, Peter was saying, there's, and as Baird was saying, there, we didn't always agree. Um, one of the things that we were very uh, strong to disagree about um, was whether or not his view was adequately um, able to incorporate some of the feminist insights um, that Carol Adams um, and I, Marty Peel, had been developing. And, and there was really a concern that the right um, perspective wasn't able to fully embrace um, some of the um, contextual and particular uh, views that feminist scholars were developing. Tom was always able to say that he wanted, he didn't see that this was um, a conflict. And I think at the time when I was younger and a little bit more ornery, um, I wasn't um, as appreciative of the ways in which this particular perspective that he had um, was um, able to be uh, incorporated. I last saw Tom at Marty Peel's memorial, and we were reminiscing um, about our time at the sit-in. He was, he was, he kept saying, <laughs> this is probably not something I should talk about, but he kept saying, remember that time we spent the night together? <laughs> I don't know if he understood the feminist comment that I was making. But what he was talking about was really um, this idea um, that um, we really did have this bonding moment um, and many nights together at the NIH. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm just gonna be brief. Um, I have a really terrifically fond memory of Tom, even though we disagreed um, considerably over the years. And one of the things I'm particularly interested in moving back to is um, this idea that uh, Mylan was just talking about of a subject of a life. Um, really, the notion that animals have particular concerns about their own particular lives, their distinct points of view, their own personalities, and their resistance ultimately to be generalized over is something that what I, was, I think, in a central part of this notion of being a subject of a life. And it's something that I've been incorporating in my work, both with chimpanzees, but also um, with entangled empathy. And so I think it's really important um, in our recognition of the contribution that Tom Reagan made 
um, not just as an activist, not just as a scholar, but this notion of a subject of a, of a life is really well worth returning to, and I encourage you all to do so in the context of remembering Thomas. Laurie, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Alejandro. Uh, I want to thank Kim for the, my suggestion of reading my contribution first in English and then in Spanish. Le agradezco a Kim este, mi sugerencia de leer primero mi contribución en inglés, después en español. Uh, Tom Regan never came, unfortunately, as far as I know, to Mexico. However, his thesis that non-human animals have rights had a deep influence also in our country, although, as he himself sometimes complained, such idea was attributed by many to Peter Singer. I've had the pleasure and the self-imposed duty to spread his ideas along many years of teaching, writing, and giving talks on animal ethics. I have even dared to claim that Singer would have to accept that animals have moral rights if we recognize that he ha we have uh, moral obligations toward them. Two of his many articles were translated into Spanish, one in 1998, Animal Rights, Human Wrongs, uh, from 1980, the other in 2004, Dos Environmental Ethics, Rest on a Mistake, from 1992. However, his main book, uh, The Case for Animal Rights, 1983, took too long a time to be translated. It was published in September uh, 2016, and my colleague, uh, Gustavo Ortiz, who must be somewhere over there, uh, had the happy opportunity, thanks to Tom's wife, uh, to show to him in 2017 an, an issue of the Spanish translation when he was at the hospital. Tom, already very weak, uh, took a brief look at the book and smiled with a great gesture of satisfaction. He died, as you know, on 17 February last year. Uh, it was a real pity that uh, it was too late for him to be with us for the presentation of his book at the yearly international book fair in Guadalajara last year in December. Uh, Tom, the philosopher ethicist, was also a commi committed activist in his preface to the 2004 edition, he said some things as the following, I'm going to quote some phrases. Positive change is occurring, though at a much slower rate than I imagined. If I have learned anything, it is that the struggle for animal rights is not the faint of heart, for, for the faint of heart. I don't know <coughs> what possessed me to think <coughs> that a book in moral theory could change the world. People need to do more than be convinced by a philosophical argument for the rights of animals. And in another book, The Struggle for Animals, uh, he wrote the following. Among the most gratifying things in my life is my knowledge that I have played some role, however small, in making this revolution happen. The best tribute we can play to Tom Regan's memory is to keep struggling for the ideals uh, to which he devoted his entire life. <clears throat> no tuvimos la suerte de que Tom Regan viniera alguna vez a México, sin, eh, hasta donde yo sé. Sin embargo, su tesis de que los animales no humanos tienen derechos tuvo una profunda influencia también en nuestro país, aunque como él mismo se llegó a quejar, Dicha idea fuese atribuida por muchos a Peter Singer. Yo he tenido el placer y el deber autoimpuesto de difundir sus ideas durante años a lo largo de mis cursos, escritos, conferencias y pláticas sobre ética animal. Incluso me he atrevido a sostener que Singer tendría que aceptar que los animales tienen derechos morales si reconocemos que tenemos obligaciones morales hacia ellos. Dos de sus muchos artículos fueron traducidos al español, uno en 1998, Derechos Animales y Justicias Humanas, de 1980, el otro en 2004, se basa en un error, la ética ambiental, de 1992. Sin embargo, su principal obra, 
en defensa de los derechos de los animales de 1983, tardó mucho tiempo en ser traducido. Se publicó en septiembre de 2016 y en 2017 mi colega Gustavo Ortiz, que por aquí deben dar, tuvo la feliz oportunidad, gracias a la esposa de Reagan, de mostrarle a este un ejemplar de la traducción al español cuando se encontraba hospitalizado. Tom, ya muy débil, vio el libro y esbozó una sonrisa de satisfacción. Murió en febrero 17 del año pasado. Fue una verdadera lástima que fuese demasiado tarde para que nos acompañase en la presentación que hice de su libro en la Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara en diciembre del año pasado. Tom Reagan fue un gran teórico, filósofo, eticista y también un gran activista. En su epílogo a la reimpresión de 2004 dijo algunas frases como estas. Está ocurriendo un cambio positivo, aunque a una velocidad mucho más lenta de lo que me imaginaba. Si algo he aprendido es que la lucha por los derechos de los animales no es para pusilánimes. No sé qué me hizo pensar que un libro de teoría moral podía cambiar el mundo. Las personas necesitan algo más que ser convencidas por un argumento filosófico a favor de los derechos de los animales. Y en otro libro, eh, The Struggle for Animal Rights, la lucha por los derechos de los animales, escribió, entre las cosas más gratificantes en mi vida está saber que he jugado algún papel, por pequeño que sea, para hacer que esta revolución suceda. El mejor homenaje que le podemos hacer a Tom Reagan es seguir luchando por los ideales para los que él vivió con una entrega absoluta. Thank you. Gracias. Alejandro, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the special work that you've done in getting um, Tom's work out into, into the Spanish-speaking world. That's a fantastic contribution. <laughs> Now, I've just remembered I'm supposed to do a little housekeeping task here. So forgive me for a second, Dale. It, it, please sign this uh, uh, form with your name and email address. If you're interested in, in uh, uh, further work of mining animals um, focusing on Tom Reagan, um, Rob? So sign up on this form uh, with your name and email address uh, if you would like to uh, be kept up to date with more work that Minding Animals will do about Tom's, Tom's work. We've got two, okay, there's two. Okay, so our, our final speaker, our last speaker in this group is uh, Dale Jameson. So thank you to all. This has been a quite enlightening and informative session, seeing the different pictures of I met Tom Reagan early in January, 1975. I had just fallen into a one semester teaching job at North Carolina State University. My banjo playing roommate had been teaching there and his band had caught a break, so he was leaving town on short notice. The folks in Raleigh didn't have much choice but to take me. There was no reason for anyone to pay much attention to me. I was a graduate student commuting in three days a week from a house I was building by hand in the woods outside of Chapel Hill, and I was only going to be around for a few months. But of course, Tom befriended me. We discovered very quickly that we had some improbable things in common. We were both Irish Lutherans. I was more Lutheran than he was, but he was more Irish than I was. And we were both vegetarians. Now, here there was a difference. Tom was a vegetarian for moral reasons. I was a vegetarian because of someone I was dating. <laughs> Now, Tom had just written his first paper on vegetarianism, the moral basis of vegetarianism that Peter had referred to. Now, at this point, the paper had been accepted, but it had not yet been published. I thought it was crazy, beginning with the title. There were lots of good reasons to be vegetarian. For example, impressing someone you're dating. But what did morality have to do with it? So 
After spending a weekend with the paper, it no longer seemed crazy. I didn't agree with everything that Tom had written. This was philosophy, after all. But it was serious stuff. I wound up staying at North Carolina State until 1978, and I remember those years as a time of constant conversation. I would talk and drink myself silly and wake up the next morning on Tom and Nancy's couch and find myself still talking. And well, I was doing a lot of talking, Tom was doing a lot of writing. From 1975 to 1983, he was unbelievably productive, publishing more than 30 papers, capping it off with the publication of his masterwork, The Case for Animal Rights. If you read through Tom's writings from that period, you will see philosophy being done in real time. Tom tries out ideas, he takes them back, he reformulates them, he pushes them a little further, he revises them again, reverses, defends, and he finally settles on a view and works it out in great detail. The case for animal rights is the most compelling work of the 20th century defending the rights of animals. The only book that compares with it in force and power is Henry Salt's 1894 book, Animals' Rights Considered in Relation to Social Progress. And that's a book I highly recommend for anyone who hasn't read it. In order to fully understand the importance of the case for animal rights, it helps to appreciate the philosophical landscape in which it was written. Since the 18th century, English-speaking ethics has been dominated by arguments between utilitarians and their critics. Utilitarianism, like all the views I'll briefly mention, comes in various sophisticated varieties. But at its heart, it's the view that universal happiness or pleasure is the ultimate good, and whatever acts promote this are right. This tradition has been more dominant in Australian and British philosophy than in American philosophy, but it's been influential in the United States as well. Peter Singer's 1975 book, Animal Liberation, was a natural consequence of this tradition. If you take seriously the idea that our moral duty is to produce universal happiness, then choosing tofu rather than turkey follows pretty obviously. The trouble is, not everyone accepts utilitarianism. The fact that utilitarianism implies vegetarianism, at least, can be seen as much as an argument against utilitarianism as an argument in favor of vegetarianism. American moral philosophy in the 1970s was dominated by two Harvard philosophers, John Rawls and Robert Nozick. Both were opponents of utilitarianism. Rawls was a follower of the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant, and Nozick was a libertarian. To make a long story very short, what Tom did was to assemble a powerful theory of animal rights from the elements of what were then the prevailing normative theories in American philosophy. This was an extremely difficult task, much more challenging than finding a utilitarian basis for animal protection. Kantian and libertarian theories tended to focus on the importance of rational, rationality and autonomy and to center on ideas of human dignity. What Tom did was to go deep and argue that being the subject of a life was more fundamental and important than any of these other considerations, and that normal adult mammals shared this being subject of a life with normal human beings. What Tom argued was that the ultimate source of all rights, human and non-human, is being the subject of a life, having a life of one's own that one can direct that can go better and worse. What this meant in terms of the philosophical dialectic is that you could no longer reject animal protection by rejecting utilitarianism. There was now on offer a powerful philosophical theory in the spirit of contemporary American philosophy that went even further in the direction of animal protection than utilitarianism. The circle was closing around moral philosophers and others who just didn't want to think about animals. 
with the subsequent work of other philosophers who I think have not gotten enough attention, including Mary Midgley and Stephen Sapanzas, among others, who held yet other theoretical perspectives, the circle tightened even more and became all but inescapable. What drove Tom to take on this task? He was a young, obscure philosopher who in the first eight years after receiving his PhD published only two papers. Like many philosophers of his generation, Tom was appalled by the Vietnam War and wanted philosophy to make a difference. In the 1960s and 1970s, this led philosophers in many different directions. It led Tom to Gandhi. Tom's lifelong philosophical project, in, in my view, was born first in the idea that philosophy should make a difference in the world, and second, in providing a philosophical foundation for Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence in the reigning philosophical vocabulary of our day. And indeed, it's useful to remember that Tom's first paper that we've been talking about, The Moral Foundation of Vegetarianism, bore the same title as a pamphlet published by Gandhi in 1959. In 1985, Nancy and Tom established the Culture and Animals Foundation. What Nancy and Tom saw, uh, much more vividly than most of us, is how important imagination is to social change. The first task is to make the horrors that befall animals visible. The second task is to make a better world imaginable. Both of these tasks are beyond philosophy. This again raises the question of how Tom got there when so many other brilliant philosophers seem to think that what was needed is one more argument and another dose of reason, this time perhaps in a louder voice. Now, weirdly perhaps, I think this has something to do with Tom's lifelong fascination with the British philosopher G.E. Moore who lived from 1873 to 1958. Tom wrote about Moore in his dissertation, and after writing The Case for Animal Rights, he went on to publish a book on Moore and edit two volumes of his papers. Now, on the surface, it's hard to see what Tom saw in Moore. Moore was a utilitarian for whom common sense was the ultimate philosophical touchstone. What would he have made of animal rights? more hobnobbed with aristocrats. He not only spent most of his life as a professor at Cambridge, but he was a member of Cambridge's most elite and secretive society, the Apostles. Moore was so formal in his demeanor that his own wife called him Moore. <laughs> what Tom was attracted to, I think, uh, was the young Moore who was described by Bertrand Russell, quoting Russell now, as beautiful and slim, with a look almost of inspiration, with a kind of exquisite purity. It was this Moore who wrote in the last chapter of his masterwork, Principia Ethica, that, quote, personal affections and aesthetic enjoyments are by far the greatest goods we can imagine. Moore was the prophet of early 20th century Bohemia because he was an early exponent of all you need is love and beauty. And this, with a heavy dose of moral rigor, inspired by the greatest of all Lutheran philosophers, Immanuel Kant, works pretty well as a credo for Tom's life. Tom's aesthetics not only ran to the visual arts and photography in particular, but also to good scotch and a well-drawn pint of Guinness and his personal affections ran very deep into a great many people, including many people in this room. And of course, they also ran to all those suffering animals. Thank you. Dale, thank you very much. That was uh, really quite moving, I think. Um, so the next step in this panel is for some in interaction between and amongst them, and, and I'm perhaps uh, going to try and kick this off with them by asking them each 
to identify or recommend which book or paper of Tom's would you recommend someone to read who has not yet read Tom Rogers? You can answer this in any order that you want. Just make sure everyone can hear you. Um, the paper that I think is, has been most important um, is one argument, um, how does it go? Yeah, it, in any case, it's the it's the argument in which he outlined uh, the rather ill-named uh, argument for marginal cases, which has been the linchpin, I think, of uh, animal ethics in both the utilitarian and in the and in the Kantian uh, tradition. So, so um, I often refer to that in my. In, in tracing the history of both environmental philosophy and or, or environmental ethics and animal ethics as, as that which liberated uh, philosophical ethics from anthropocentric. Tell us the name of the title of it again. Uh, it's, it, it's, an it's, in the it's in the journal Inquiry in the in 1970s. Yeah. One, yeah. One argument in defense of blah, 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 basically. <laughs> somebody, somebody can Google it. I would recommend, so I think with most philosophers, the best thing to read is the first thing they read and may, write and maybe sometimes the last thing they write, sometimes. So I would say it's that first paper, A Moral Basis of Vegetarianism, and that's in part because it does connect to practice uh, as well as to theory. I think that there is uh, a really nice piece called The Case for Animal Rights, which is a small piece, and it's available online at the Animal Rights Library, and there's a PDF you can download, and it's a really easy, um, ac it's really accessible, it's not an easy piece, but it's an accessible piece, and I love to teach it, so I would recommend that. So I, I agree, I think that's a very good article. It's also antho uh, anthologized in a number of uh, anthologies, uh, including <coughs> my recent anthology, uh, that was dedicated to Tom Reagan. Uh, so, but I think I would recommend, in terms of a book, um, a book called um, Animal Rights, Human Wrongs, which he lays out the case for animal rights, but in a way that I think is much more accessible than um, in the case for animal rights. Um. I don't remember the title of the one I was going to recommend, but I suspect it's the one that Laurie recommended. Is it in the Animals Reader, Kayloff and Fitzgerald's? Then that's the one, The Case for Animal Rights. It's a good introductory text. Well, for those people who are not much into philosophy, uh, sometimes it's uh, easier, instead of uh, reading directly the arguments, going to the, to the person, to his biography, and in that sense, I would recommend to, re to read the preface to this book, The Struggles for Animal Rights, where he uh, s uh, describes his childhood and how he got into the animal rights movement. And uh, also, I would recommend to read the preface to the 2004 edition, because it tells us much about the, how, the, how the creative uh, work functions. He describes how uh, he was kind of possessed by a spirit and couldn't stop writing and writing and writing and writing and no, no, doing nothing else than writing this book. It's incredible to see how the, for somebody who's, who is interested in the creative process, is very instructive. Good, thank you. They're, they're all very helpful suggestions. Um, do, you, do either of you, any of you, have a question you'd like to ask of each other? So what we can do now is, uh, oh, you did bed? I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I have a question for, for Dale, and that is, um, you say it's very obvious from a utilitarian point of view that uh, we have animal ethics, and yet the first person to really articulate uh, in, in, a, in, in just a phrase or two uh, is Jeremy Bentham, who does not argue for vegetarianism, mm -hmm. and I think he does, he, he refuses to do so on the basis of utilitarianism. Uh, is, is, so can you explain that? 
Look, I mean, to say that something follows fairly obviously from a certain theoretical perspective doesn't mean that there's not all kinds of dodges that one can sort of take to try to avoid those conclusions. And often those things that we see historically as dodges are actually historically extremely important. So Bentham was living in a society that, for example, had a radically different system of food production than the one that we live in and so on. Also, Bentham was arguing at the time all kinds of incredibly sort of radical views about all sorts of other things, including the fact that not only should gay sex not be illegal, but it was actually a good thing when people enjoyed, in, enjoyed it. So, I mean, so the range of the kind of controversial views that Bentham held for his time was, you know, was already quite, quite enormous. So. Quite enough. <laughs> quite enough. Quite enough for one life. So now we move on to the uh, questions uh, from the floor. And as is my practice when I chair a session where we take questions from the floor, I'm going to take first questions from women only. So the men can wait. And I want to let women have the first uh, chance to ask questions. So we have microphones. Um, is there a woman who would like to ask a question? No one? At the back there, please. Wait for the microphone. Can I just say, first of all, it was a lovely panel. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I was really, really good friends with Tom, um, and he was very, very supportive. And I promised to tell Nancy how well it went. Um, so thank you so much. But I do have to say that I know that it's really kind of everyone to think about that women should go first, but as a longtime feminist, I, we really do have a really great voice anyway, and you don't really have to worry about it. We'll, we'll speak uh, up. Uh, I and only that's, do that's a, an opinion of a 66-year-old, but I, I did talk to other, other younger women who felt that we didn't really want somebody to say, okay, you guys can talk first. And, and, and that's, again, an opinion. But I just thought I'd mention it. The, the reason why I do this is because I go to so many meetings and I see so many questions and answers where men ask the first questions and they invariably ask the first, the second, and the third, and the fourth, and then eventually a woman uh, asks a question. And uh, when I've done this, I've always seen that there are the, the women have the opportunity to ask questions first. Um, and I will continue to do it because I think it's the right thing to do. If you want to wait until men ask the question for you to ask the question, that's <laughs> fine with me. Uh, so I appreciate your comments and, and thank you very much. Um, so is there uh, anyone else like to make a question? Yes. No, I think this sort of fits well. I'm just curious if anybody knows what, what role or contributions Tom's wife played. Um, so very often, uh, scholars do not work in isolation of their partners. And so I just find myself curious um, if anybody knows whether they collaborated or did he lock himself in a room and do all this stuff? Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to say something and then, and I, uh, Tom and, and Nancy were very, very close. Where, where's the lady gone who's asked? Ask a question, I can't see it now. They were very, very close. And um, I don't know if they collaborated in a formal way in the sense of writing, but I know that they were very much as one in, their, uh, in sharing the same beliefs and that there must have been many conversations that happened in the, in the Reagan home over the years on many different issues. Um, and uh, she was, they, they were very much a couple and um, a, of equal standing. Plus also with their work with Culture and Animals Foundation, they were also very much e equal standing there as well. Uh, and yeah, well I was just gonna say that um, Nancy played a, a really instrumental role in the, culture, uh, in the Compassionate Living Festivals and took on 
almost all of the organ organizational responsibilities, which were enormous. Um, uh, putting on a vegan conference in Raleigh, North Carolina in the uh, 1990s um, took a great deal of work. The conferences were fairly large, 200 people. Um, so she did a lot of work there. And in terms of the grant proposals, um, all of the grant proposals come into Nancy uh, as still today. She organizes them and distributes them to other board members. So um, she has played a, a critical role in, um, in advancing uh, the ideas of animal rights through CAF. Like many people here, I never got to meet Tom Regan, but it's thanks to him that my first book was published. Um, in 1989, an acquisitions editor from Temple uh, heard a talk that I gave at NWSA um, called Ecofeminism, Women, Animals, Nature, Feminist Animals in the Environment. It was the first time that I'd met Marty Keel and Ariel Sulla, and we started the NWSA Ecofeminist Caucus. And um, this acquisitions editor uh, said, I, I think I know a good series for you. It's called the Ethics and Action series. And um, I had never published anything. <laughs> and he just opened doors for me. And I never met him. And I want to know, how did that series get started? Do any of you know how did he get that series launched? So there's a, there's a woman named Jane Cullen, who I think some people in this room know, who was, a, who was editor at Temple University Press at, at that time. And she and Tom formed a very close bond very, very early on. And so she was the person who was the, the in-house Temple University Press editor for the series that Tom, that Tom edited. So Jane, uh, who, is still, who is still alive and uh, in New York, um, although I think she's not particularly well, um, is also a very I important sort of indirect cause for the good things that came to you through Tom Greta. Okay, any more questions? By the way, before you put the question, Greta, you did not say your name or introduce yourself or all the title of the books. I think, she, I think she's finished now. She's going to have to run back now. Oh, oh can you uh, please choose to again? My name is Greta Gard, and the book was called Ecofeminism, Women, Animals, Nature. It came out in 1993. I was invited by the acquisitions editor to write a, a monograph uh, based on the talk that I did, and I refused, and I told her that I thought we were on the cusp of a movement, and the, the correct thing to do would be to uh, write it create an anthology to open the door for many voices rather than a single authored book and she had to take it that way or I wasn't going to do it and she did. Thank you. If you could, could please introduce yourselves. I'm sorry I should have said that uh, from the outset. I'm Leslie Irvin and um, I was wondering what you, the panel would have to say about um, directions within animal studies, anthrozoology, that Tom would particularly want to cultivate. I, I appreciated knowing or being reminded of the revolving door and that we shouldn't be revolving door activists, but within that context, do you think that there are particular directions that he would like to see the field go in? I think that Tom would be most uh, glad about the direction that um, animal uh, ethology though, or ethology has taken. Uh, when he was beginning uh, his work, it was the um, it was professional suicide for uh, ethologists to refer to anything except the external behavior of uh, animals. Tom was, of course, 
one of the first people to to insist upon the rich subjectivity of animals and now the pendulum has swung in a different direction um, the mark beckoffs of the field have won the day uh, and um, as um, uh, as um, the most animal eth eth ethologists today uh, including Franz de Duval will say that anthropomorphism is now well respected uh, in the field. And so the science has really finally caught up uh, with, uh, with uh, Tom's philosophy. So I think that he would be most pleased to see that direction uh, uh, in, in which the, the, the science of animal studies has taken. Um, as I was indicating, and I think following up on what Margot said too, I think that um, it's really important, um, it was really important for Tom and I think it's important for many of us that our scholarly work be accountable to the social movements that we're sort of engaging with. And so I think that would be something that he would really um, value about what's happening in some parts of animal studies, that there's an accountability. Um, that people are recognizing that the work is, again, to go back to what Rod was saying earlier, is not just being done in an ivory tower, but that it is actually having um, an impact on uh, the flourishing of particular individual animal lives. In his book, uh, Empty Cages, in, in the final chapter of that book, he talks a little bit about the kinds of campaigns animal that are consistent with the animal rights program. Uh, and he actually does endorse a form of incrementalism, um, even though he's an abolitionist. Um, there are certain single issue campaigns that are compatible with the animal rights movement, a campaign to ban foie gras completely. That would eliminate one entire form of exploitation. Uh, the kinds of campaigns he would be opposed to would be certain kinds of welfarist campaigns that say, give chickens slightly more space because he thinks the chickens in those slightly larger cages would still be used as a means to an end, which is incompatible with the rights movement. But he does endorse this kind of uh, incrementalism. He says that this, this tyranny, this wall of tyranny is gonna have to be taken down a brick at a time. So anytime you eliminate entirely a form of uh, using animals as a means, uh, that's consistent with the, the kinds of uh, changes that animal rights activists can fully back. So th there's one other thing about Tom that I think really needs to be said to present a somewhat fuller picture, and it's really sort of almost, I think, the Gandhian side of Tom. Um, because we're putting a lot of emphasis on Tom as an activist, which he certainly was and extremely committed. But Tom also worked at a university, which is one of the largest universities in the United States devoted to animal agriculture. And Tom maintained amazingly exemplary relationships with his colleagues throughout the university. And in fact, he was given the university's most distinguished professorship, which is the sort of thing that does not happen if you're not on good terms with your colleagues. And the fact that North Carolina State University at the library has now has the Tom Reagan archive is also testimony to that. So in some ways, I think the most amazing thing about Tom uh, was yes, he was an incredible activist. Yes, he was an extremely good philosopher. Uh, he took very strong views about all sorts of things, but at the same time, he was able to maintain an incredible network of relationships with people with whom he had profound disagreements. Another question, please. Yes, please, down, down here in the middle, third row. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, I'm Heather Kendrick. Uh, I really, one thing I really enjoyed was um, Dale Jameson's little historical overview of uh, how Tom Reagan emerged as this voice for a, a more deontological uh, animal ethics as opposed to utilitarianism, which has a more natural in into uh, animal rights uh, philosophy. So the question I'm wondering about is, and this is for anybody, but perhaps especially for Dale, um, recently, there's been a trend toward uh, more explicitly neo-Kantian approaches to animal ethics, and 
I know that Tom Reagan resisted attempts to call him the Kantian animal ethicist, and for good reason, because Kantian has a good reason to be kind of a bad word uh, in animal ethics. But in more recent in more recent times, some animal ethicists or some Kantians are trying to reclaim Kantian as something that is okay to be in animal ethics. So I'm wondering, is that something that owes its influence to Tom at all, or do you think that's an entirely separate tradition that happens to be springing up uh, in, in that way? Um, so the other philosophers on the panel may have opinions about this, but I think, um, so of course the most important person in the tradition that you're talking about is Chris Korsgaard, who was a speaker at the second Mind Minding Animals Conference, who's developed a very powerful, uh, you might think of it as a neo-Kantian uh, philosophy of, of animal protection. Um, the key move for someone like Korsgaard, I think, and, and others in that tradition is the naturalization of a lot of stuff in Kant that required commitment uh, to things that most of us would no longer be committed to. Tom, you know, essentially after writing The Case for Animal Rights and then doing this work on war, which is interesting, was really not very active in professional philosophy after that. So I just, I, I don't know actually, I, I would doubt that there was much uh, influence actually in either direction. And it was a sad thing in a way that I think that that Tom's work was not as influential on the sort of purely philosophical profession um, in, in the generation after as it should as it should have been. Anyone else want to comment on this? No? Well, thank Do you we very have much. another question? Please hand the microphone over. Hi, I'm Annette Bickford, and I'm from Toronto, York University. Um, I have I don't know anything about Tom. I'm going to start reading. Um, but I wonder how he would feel about um, the Inuit in Clyde River who have just brought the first um, Supreme Court case from Nunavut, uh, the first Canadian Supreme Court case, on seismic testing. And they're against seismic testing because it's deafening the sea mammals that they rely on for their food. Now there's also food being flown up there, which is ve very costly. And um, I've got a friend who did seismic testing. She did, um, she's a marine biologist and she did a lot of work on sound and seismic testing. And she said that, you know, some of the Inuit that she talked, who she spoke with expressed ambivalence about killing whales narwhals and so on. They did express some ambivalence about it. But I wonder what Tom would think about all of this because, you know, Greenpeace has kind of retracted its position on the seal hunt and um, and on animal harvest, harvesting quote-unquote in the Arctic. What would Tom say? Okay. Thank you. Can I try it? Um, so I think it's really important to understand the abolitionist perspective that, I mean, I think Manon just really importantly highlighted that Tom was um, definitely could be an incrementalist in the sense that there could be particular campaigns that would end a certain kind of instrumentalization of animals. Um, but I don't, my sense, and correct me anybody if I'm, I'm wrong about this, but the position that he was trying that he did actually advocate is a position, an, an abolitionist position, a position that says that we are not under any circumstance entitled to use others who have lives that matter, whether that's indigenous lives that matter, whether that's black lives that matter, whether that's whale lives that matter, that it's not, it's not something that we can ethically justify. Now, having said that about abolitionism, I think it's also really important to recognize that Ab I, and the way I like to think of abolitionism is as a aspiration, as a way of imagining a different kind of world. Um, and so I think that, that, I think Tom would be opposed to um, indigenous slaughter um, at, for these reasons. It, it actually didn't come up in any of our comments, but the, the kind of rights that Tom Reagan defended were negative rights rights to non-interference, rights not to be harmed, rights to be left alone. Um, and so if these animals are being killed, then they're not being left alone. Uh, there's an interesting twist to having negative rights. That is, um, 
the only sense in which we have positive duties towards animals is we have positive duties to prevent people from violating the negative rights of animals so if there are some corporations that are violating these animals rights um, as animal rights activists we should be working to shut them down it might also be worth adding just as a philosophical postscript that in, in, in some of this was coming out and some of the things will has been will Kim Lick has been saying in sessions today is that a lot of philosophers tend to think of of rights as being defeasible, as being pragmatic stops, as being things that can be given kind of consequentialist justifications. This was not Tom's view of rights. I mean, this was a view of, of rights that was about as, as, I mean, and this is the connection with Nozick and libertarianism. I mean, this is, a, this is a view that was about as absolutist about rights as you can get. If I remember correctly, and, and Mylon, correct me, if, or any of you, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Tom wrote in the case around rights, there was the fundamental right of respect respectful treatment, which was a, a positive affirmation of rights. And I think you're right. It was, for Tom, rights were a line drawn in, in, in the sand. Um, we've got time for one more question, then I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, we'll let that one man now ask a question. <laughs> See, I'm sure these questions would not have been asked if I had opened out straight to everyone. Porter, um, my question is, who determines what is a subject of a life, or who is a subject of a life, or what are the criteria that determine that definition? Milo? Well, um, Tom took himself to be disagreeing with Peter Singer on the fundamental property that confers um, uh, moral considera considerability. Um, Peter Singer talks about sentience, the capacity to feel or suffer. Uh, Tom appeals to a richer, complex psychological property um, that certainly uh, uh, involves sentience, but it also involves um, beliefs, desires, preferences, um, an emotional life. Uh, it was important that these beings have psychological continuity over time. Uh, Peter Singer often talked as if there could be merely sentient beings who are aware of pain, but in some weird sense, completely stuck in the present. I actually think that's an incoherent view because to experience pain takes duration. So the psychology has to persist over time if a being's able to experience pain. And I think that's what was unique about Tom's perspective. He saw that, that to be a subject of a life, you have to have a psychological continuity that stretches through time, beliefs and desires, and what he talked about in the case for animal rights was preferential autonomy. Um, so Kant talked about moral autonomy, the, the, to be able to make free moral choices. But for Tom, for Tom, it was just the ability to make choices about what you want to do in the current environment you're in. Um, and so th that's basically what he had in mind by being a subject of a life. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make a very brief concluding r remarks um, and say that um, unlike the panel, I am not an academic. I'm an angry and frustrated vegan animal rights campaigner. <laughs> and I want to speak from that point of view about Tom's work because I've had the benefit over the years of, of seeing the publication of Singer's book, Animal Liberation, in 75, and reading that and learning how to read philosophy, having not been taught it, and then meeting Singer and learning more about his, his point of view, and then discovering Tom Reagan and his work, and realizing that there was actually different points of view that could be had here, and then spending time with the Reagans and, and uh, being with them as activists, not as a philosopher and then with the influence of ecofeminism. So there's very much, over the last 30, 40 odd years, an evolution of thinking about animal ethics. And uh, Tom's contribution to that evolution is profound, is significant. And um, what I find distressing now is that seeing in the so-called animal rights movement, 
that there is a shift away from rights-based campaigning and advocacy and more of an emphasis on utilitarian-based effective altruism campaigning. And uh, that is an issue that I think that the animal rights movement, or more broadly, however you want to describe the animal rights, animal rights movement, that is something that we need to be very aware of and fully discuss because the movement is going in a direction which I think is actually moving away from what Tom Reagan uh, advocated. So with that very sobering remark, um, I want to thank you all very much for coming, and I want to join in thanking the panel. Responded a while back um, when you were doing the uh, Encyclopedia of, uh, of Environmental Evidence. Yes. I've got a couple of pieces in there. Oh, great. In well, fact, um, Tom actually, uh, I think you contacted Tom and Tom passed them on to me, and that's how I wound up in the. I did the one on ethical extensionism yeah. and the one on Paul Taylor. Uh, both of those were excellent. Well, actually, uh, really, I, I remember it, but, I, but I'm glad to be reminded that you're the author. I actually, I remember the content from oh. the one particular one place. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. And I, I wanted to ask you just a little bit of a relationship between Ron and the Just want the file, like a single oh, yeah. word file? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This is usually a little bit below the reach of 